Hello whiskey lovers around the world. Welcome back again to part two of the interview with uh, Ian Buxton, the whiskey writer. Uh, Ian was at one time um, uh, marketing director of Glenmorangie. He's done loads of stuff with lots of different uh, whiskey companies around Scotland, written about uh, whiskey all over the world, has travelled around the world, revived old whiskey books, and now I have here uh, part two. The first part was the interview with Ian on his new book, The Enduring Legacy of Jewers. And now uh, from the Whiskey Forum in Holland, I have some questions here on a paper in my hand to, uh, to put to Ian. And the question number one from, from the group, this is from uh, a man who knows a lot about wine, used to deal in wine. Uh, Ian, uh, welcome back again. And Ian, the, the question is um, if you, um, uh, the, the, the harvesting year of vintage wines are very important about the, uh, the quality of the, the drink wine itself uh, for ex and champagne and port too. Uh, for example, the, the, the wine years uh, 2005, it was a top year for uh, Bordeaux wine from the Medoc and Graaf uh, region, Pomerol, saint Emilion. 1982 until 1986 were very bad years for red wines from the northern Rhone type, uh, region and um, people wouldn't even like to buy these wines, uh, uh, or wouldn't even like to try them let alone uh, uh, buy them because they know already that they're bad. Um, what this gentleman would like to know is uh, is the different vintages in whiskey, um, are there good years and bad years? Do you have uh, years where the where the the grain where the where the the barley is better than others does that exist in whiskey at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, well that, that's interesting. So yes, as your as your questioner says, um, vintage years are, are are very important in certain wines. Not all wine, of course, because the, the 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 wine that we buy for Friday night uh, at the supermarket probably isn't uh, a vintage, or or the vintage is less important because they. The vinification techniques on, on mass market wines have, have gone up so much that the, the reliability is there. But certainly in the fine wine market, as he says, with the, the fine wines of Bordeaux, the Claret cla wines that, that, you, that you mentioned there, uh, vintage ports and so forth, the vintage year is, is all important. And that's all about uh, weather, about climatic conditions, and about the quality of the harvest and the actual harvesting of the wine at that time. Uh, he did also mention champagne in the question, and, and that's interesting because it does lead us into whiskey in a curious way. Uh, there are vintage champagnes, but they're only a very small part of the market. The vast majority of champagne is a blended wine, and so, as we know, the vast majority of whiskey that we drink, Scotch whiskey, um, is blended. I mean, more than 90% around the world is taken up by the great blends. Now, if you of the single malts, uh, and we think particularly of Glen Rothes and, and Bal Blair, have uh, come up with this idea of a vintage, but it's it's not completely a marketing gimmick. That would be unfair to suggest that. And clearly, the, the, uh, the barley is an agricultural product, and so there will be seasonal uh, annual variations. But the nature of the process of making whiskey is different, and this is critical from wine. And this is critical to the answer. Uh, wine, of course, is a vinification process. Uh, whiskey is distilled, and, and the, the chemistry of that is very different, and the impact on the spirit quality as opposed to wine is very different. With wine, we're, we're aiming for 12 to 15 percent alcohol by volume, and spirit, of course, as you know, comes off a pot still in the 60 percent of a, of a continuous still in the 90s, and the impact of the distillation process uh, on spirit character is probably far more important than minor flavor variations in the barley which has subsequently been malted and then secondly a huge contribution to whiskey flavor uh, is the the wood the quality of the wood the amount of time that the whiskey spends in the wood what the wood was originally used for so i would say that that, that there are differences uh, in these vintages they are detectable but they are relatively trivial in the greater picture of what makes up the flavor of a whiskey Okay, okay, thanks. So that's, if, that, if that helps, if that helps. Yeah, I think it does, yes. yes. Thank you. And, and uh, another question, uh, the, the Scotch Whiskey Association are putting down uh, new rules and regulations uh, as regards to how, what can be called whiskey, Scotch whiskey, that is, and what not. Uh, yeah. An example that we've seen, and many eyebrows in Holland have been raised, 
uh, was that John Glazer with his Compass Box Company was uh, chided for putting in wooden staves in his barrels and he wasn't allowed to call it Scotch because of that. Um, do you think that the stringent rules of the, the Scotch Whiskey Association uh, tends to hold innovation back or uh, would you say it's, it's very important to keep our uh, heritage uh, protected? Well, no, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question, uh, actually, Jock. It's worth stepping back and, and saying, well, what is the SWA, the Scotch Whiskey Association? Um, it's, it's good to remember that it's an industry trade body. It's not a consumer protection body. It's not a consumer body. It's about the interests of its industry members. And it's also worth saying that not everybody in the Scotch whisky industry is in memberships. Most companies are, but some companies like uh, Brickladdy, for example, take fairly uh, strong exception to the SWA policies and are not in membership. So who are the SWA? They are a representative of a significant part of the Scotch whisky industry, but the industry, not the consumer, and a good part of the industry, not all of it. Secondly, the new regulations that you're referring to, um, you talk about them as if they, 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 they are the SWA's regulations, and indeed they've been instrumental uh, in formulating these, but they've been doing that in consultation uh, with the industry and with consumer groups, and people like John Glazer have had a, a voluble amount to say about it. And uh, the UK Government uh, Department for, for Food and Agriculture, the DEFRA, and eventually, quite soon now, these regulations will pass into UK and then into European law. So they will have the force of European law. Now, the vast majority uh, of what they've proposed in new regulations, to me, is absolutely sound. Uh, it's absolutely sound. It's going to be beneficial to the consumer, beneficial to the industry. It's going to help us with the export and promotion of Scotch whisky right around the world. However, uh, a number of people, uh, and I'm amongst them, have taken exception to some small aspects. And these have been uh, the subject of extensive debate. I think the time for debate is over. I think that uh, the process is now rolling through the parliamentary legislative procedure and the debate has been lost. But uh, this comes down to the, the, the famous new category of blended malt whiskey, which has been very controversial. Mm -hmm. and the SWA's reading of what makes up heritage and traditional practice. We can see some specific examples of this. This has uh, aroused the ire of the distillers at Loch Lomond Distillers, not in membership of the SWA, one of the largest companies not in membership. They made what they call a single malt whiskey in a column still. Yeah. They use a 100% malted barley mash. The still is 100% copper. And they can go back to the early part of the 20th century and show that to be practiced within certain parts of the Scottish whisky industry. Not majority practice, not widely practiced, but definitely going on over 100 years ago. It's been ruled out of order. That now can't be called single malt whisky, oh. to the great distress of the people at Loch Lomond. Then you have the case of, of uh, John Glazer at Compass Box and the spice tree, which was the insertion yep. of staves into the barrels, added phenomenally to the flavor of that whiskey. John was required to remove it. So we look back and we say, well, why would the SWA be doing that? The cynical answer is that as an industry body acting for the interests of its members, uh, it's looking out for what they want uh, in these specific areas, not what the non-member companies want. So that might be a little bit controversial. My own view is that we've become somewhat hidebound uh, in our application of tradition and heritage. We've taken a very particular point of view on it. It's not always historically defensible, in my opinion, um, and there is an argument to be made that that has suppressed innovation. But it's fair to say the price of this, the price of these new regulations, is a greater uniformity, a greater clarity, and the ability for the Scotch whisky industry to market itself more confidently around the world in the face of uh, protectionism from some governments. So a lot of good is coming out of this as well as uh, some negative aspects. Okay, Ian, thank you very much for talking to us. We've run out of time, I'm afraid. We oh, want to get... long hand, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, it was lovely. Thank you very much for talking to us. Well, for all you viewers out there, just look at the link next to the movie.
and uh, you'll, uh, I'll put you to where you can find more out uh, about Ian and where to buy his book. And until next time, and to you too, Ian, slan and uh, it was nice seeing you all again. Bye. Thank you, John.